Okay, everybody. Um, welcome uh, to today's uh, small farm webinar. And today we have um, Dr. Rick Weinsrail. Rick is an extension entomologist, and uh, we in the small farms team work with Rick quite a bit uh, on a number of different programs. And uh, Rick is going to talk today about the basics of insect fruit management. I'm going to let him get started here very quickly. So let's just do a sort of an overview of how I'm going to approach this. I'm going to talk about pests of apples and peaches and small fruits. And in each case, I'm going to list the direct pest, which means the ones that feed in or on the fruit itself, and then the indirect ones that feed on other parts of the plant. And sometimes they might be in both categories. The ones I have highlighted in red will be the creatures we'll actually spend some time talking about, because they're either most important or they provide good examples of things. And the ones in black are ones that you might want to look up and just Google and find out information about or look in some of the references that I mentioned to you in a little bit. So in apples, we talk about plum curculio, cuddling moth, which is, in fact, the worm in the apple around the world, apple maggot. And we'll talk about San Jose scale as a pest that feeds on trunks and twigs, although it can be on fruit as well. And I'll urge you to look up a little bit about potato leafhopper, because it's often a problem for backyard growers who don't spray trees much, especially on small trees. But we can't cover all of them, so we will uh, do the ones that are good examples. In peaches, the key creatures are oriental fruit moth and the stink bugs and plant bugs. And then the two peach tree borers. Uh, some people call the first one in red their greater peach tree borer, um, and the other one lesser peach tree borer. And in small fruits, we could talk about a lot of them. Uh, the one that's the really important invasive is spotted wing drosophila, a fruit fly. We'll talk a bit about eastern flower thrips, slugs, and Japanese beetles. And I'll leave it to you to look up some of the others, just in the nature of time. So what are you going to do about these things? Um, for peaches and apples that are in established orchards or areas where there are mature trees around, honestly, you can see 70 to even 100% loss of yield and quality. And quality means unmarketable fruit in commercial production. Um, same thing may be true pretty soon for late season raspberries when spotted wing drosophila becomes established. Loss is typically much less in strawberries and blueberries to insects. And for all of you that are backyard growers, yeah, you can salvage a lot of fruit that wouldn't be salvageable in commercial production. And so remember, you don't need to do everything that somebody does if they're trying to sell fruit to market it. So what's been the old approach to these? Uh, let's sort of overstate a chemical pesticide approach. And that would be that except during the time tree fruits are in bloom, you would spray often enough to have some kind of a residue on the trunk and leaves or the fruit to kill anything that might be there. So you might spray on a certain interval all year long, except during the time when fruit is or when uh, blossoms are open, so that you wouldn't kill bees. So those would be called calendar-based uh, spray programs. Now the problem with this, no matter how you're doing it, is it costs more than necessary. You get more residues on fruit than you want. You cause resistance problems to develop in, in insect populations. And you basically destroy all the natural enemies, which means you get their task of trying to control the insects. Um, in fact, you can't legally use products as many times as that spray schedule might cause you to do. And there are no single insecticides out there that kill everything. So you can't just decide to spray something every two weeks, and it'll solve all your problems. Instead, what's become a more standard or uh, advanced approach to dealing with these insects is to make a couple of sprays that you pretty much use every year. And then you base the rest of your sprays on what you actually see on fruit or in traps that catch insects. So a dormant or semi-dormant spray, an emulsifiable oil, um, is pretty much a standard 
good recommendation for virtually every uh, apple and peach grower, whether it's backyard or otherwise. So these are the dormant oil sprays. They're an emulsifiable oil. Uh, you mix with water and you spray about the time the very first green tip of foliage starts to emerge in the spring. You don't make any sprays during bloom. Typically, in any kind of commercial production, there is one more automatic spray, and that's going to be a spray at petal fall. So it, as soon as the petals have dropped, bees are no longer visiting flowers. That spray is pretty much a good required spray all the time in tree fruits. And there's something sort of similar in small fruits. And then after that, you make cover sprays as needed. And that word sounds a little nasty, but it does describe what you do. You make a spray that covers the fruit, and it kills the insect before it goes in or before it feeds on it. Now, the intent there is that that cover spray is safe enough that the residues don't harm anybody by the time we are going to harvest that fruit. And that's why some insecticides can be used and others can't. There are some production practices that you can use for the backyard growers in the group. Bagging apples is actually uh, not a bad idea. And we'll show you a picture of that, and you can uh, find a reference on it. There are a few things you might do in terms of biological control. Typically, it's just don't spray too much. Uh, but biological control in fruit is something for most of us you do by not killing the natural enemies rather than trying to do something to supplement them. So for apples and peaches, uh, basic approach is you always use a superior oil before bloom. And again, this is an emulsifiable oil. It mixes with water. You spray it at about 2% by volume. And it actually coats the eggs of European red mite and rosy apple aphid and the scale covering for San Jose scale. And it suffocates those insects. You can't continue to use these um, all of the time, because once foliage is present, if you use them at the same rate, they actually cause some damage to foliage. Um, again, we'd usually use in that petal fall spray, sort of an automatic spray, uh, a spray that's effective against plum curculio or maybe stink bugs and plant bugs and peaches. And we'll look at these insects in just a little bit here. And then after that, you make your sprays based on what you might catch in traps or scouting, which is simply monitoring for insect infestations uh, on trees um, and on fruit. So how are you going to know how to do all this stuff? Um, let's start with a basic reference or two about insects and entomology. The first of the two links shown in this slide is the URL for the Introduction to Applied Entomology class here at the University of Illinois. And this class is uh, meant for beginning students in agriculture, horticulture, or just people who want to know more about insects and crops and life. Um, when you go to that page and you look at the syllabus, you can look at all sorts of different topics. If you click on the second link, that link actually goes to the lab on vegetable and fruit insects. And that's a good overview of things, or at least I think it is. It's my class, so that's, that's the criterion. Um, if you're looking for a book that's a good book about insects as pests in gardens, Whitney Cranshaw's book pictured here is just absolutely wonderful. You can buy it uh, directly or you can buy it on Amazon. Um, it's 670 some pages, tons of color pictures, and it costs a whole whopping $30. It's an absolutely great book if you're just looking for a reference. What else could you look for that would help you with, uh, with uh, general identification of insects? All of these references here, the field guide for Minnesota, the British Columbia page, the orchard pest management page from Washington, are all online resources. And you can see pictures a lot of, of a lot of insects that you might find uh, in your tree fruits or small fruits, now the, in this case, mostly tree fruits. Uh, there is also a book from Cornell that you can order at the last of these uh, URLs. And that one's not available online on its own, but it is, uh, you, can, you can purchase it online. And it's a great book. And I see on the, the chat box the questions about uh, will this be available. These will be archived. This 
presentation will be archived and you'll be able to pick up uh, that archived copy and click on these links and yes, you will be able to get to those afterwards. There are a bunch of other good books out there and depending on how serious you are, you follow up on more of them, but I'd probably start with the ones in the slide before. If you click on the one from Minnesota that was in the previous slide, uh, it's also listed at the very bottom of this list as one that you can buy as a printed copy. So those are all good references, including the pocket guides for scouting that are shown in uh, item three. For small fruit insects, there are fewer really, really good sort of picture references. The Virginia Small Fruit IPM site is quite good. And the Midwest Small Fruit Pest Management Handbook that we participate in, in developing for the North Central region uh, is also available online and gives you a lot of identification help. So those are out there. And then if you go from, all right, I've identified it to what can I learn about it that might help me with management, there are two pest management handbooks. Now these don't provide insecticide recommendations, but they do uh, provide information about insect life cycles or disease cycles for the pathogens of fruits and some of the practices that you might use to avoid those insects or diseases. Those are available online. You can get PDF copies, but you can also order them from uh, the Ag Publications Unit here at uh, campus. If we tell you you ought to go out and monitor for insects, how are you going to know uh, where to get the stuff you need? Typically what we tell you to use is a hand lens that magnifies things so you can see if it's a a leaf hopper or a mite or something else that's really, really tiny. You might use, quote, a beating tray for insects like plum curculio and uh, the stink bugs. Uh, you can make these. You don't have to buy one. You just turn a uh, lid to a styrofoam cooler upside down and hold it under a limb and tap it with a little piece of hose or something that won't hurt the limb. You knock insects loose. They fall on the tray and you can see what they are. But the thing that we especially would encourage people to use in commercial fruit production is pheromone traps. And that's what's in the picture at the lower right. Uh, the little orange uh, rubber septum in the picture at the very lower right contains an attractant that brings in a certain insect. If you know the insect is flying or present, you can make decisions about when to control them. So pheromone traps are especially important in commercial fruit production. Um, where would you get this stuff? There is a supplier in Michigan called Great Lakes IPM for integrated pest management. And uh, that's a pretty good source. Uh, the folks there won't try to oversell you a whole lot. So that's always good. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about pheromone trap use for a couple of insects, but you should know that uh, there is a summary of what are the most important insects to trap for in fruit, uh, how many traps you need, how do you hang them, how often do you have to change the lures, all these things uh, in the link that's provided there in the Illinois Fruit and Veg News. That's from, I believe, a year ago or maybe almost two years ago but the basic information is the same. So, all right. And then you get to what are you going to do about these things. Uh, let's concentrate on two or three, but not all of these. For commercial growers in the Midwest, for tree fruits, there is something called the Midwest Tree Fruit Spray Guide, and it lists pesticides for commercial growers. There is a similar publication for homeowners, and that's the one on the very bottom, and it's pest management for the home landscape. And the link for it at the bottom is where you can uh, buy a copy of the publication. And it will list insecticides and fungicides that are more readily available to backyard gardeners rather than commercial guys who buy greater quantities of things that may be more specific and less commonly available. If you are an organic grower, uh, there is no such thing as a good grower's guide to organic peach production because it's exceptionally hard to do in the Midwest. There is a good guide for uh, organic apple production that comes from Cornell. And I'll show you the link for another publication that's much like it in just a minute. 
One thing you want to know, if you look at the commercial uh, tree fruit or small fruit spray guides, is that they list a lot of different insecticides uh, at various stages through production. They are typically organized by pre-bloom, during bloom, pickle fall, and then successive cover sprays. If you look at one of these, I mean, you can see this one online. You can go to this link. You can click on the download, and you can see what these look like. Be aware that nobody is out there spraying all of that stuff. Instead, they're looking at that list to know what is available for what insects, if they need it, and when they need it. So don't ever go to one of these spray guides and figure you got to pick something to spray for everything on the list, because you may not have it. Same kind of thing for the spray guides for small fruits. And if you're an organic grower, there are really good organic production guides for blueberries, grapes, and strawberries from the uh, Cornell IPM program. And I would point out to you that, yes, we oftentimes uh, make reference to publications from other states because they've done something really well, and we don't need to do the same thing. I would come back up to this, though, and remind you that if you're a homeowner, you want to look at the one that's best management for the home landscape because not all those products that are out there for commercial growers are available to you at the small amounts that you need. So let's go back and just put a little bit of meat on the bones for the apple insects. These are products you can buy in a, in a garden center. Uh, and they will say just that, dormant oil or superior oil or tree fruit spray oil or something like that. Um, why is it we tell people this is probably a really good thing to do all the time? Well, the reason is they are very inexpensive. They control three different pests that are much harder to control later in the season, San Jose scale, rosy apple aphid, and European red mite. When you make application one or two between the very first presence of green foliage at the tip of buds, called green tip, and pink, meaning just before the, uh, the blossoms open, if you make those sprays at that time, they don't hurt any beneficials. They don't have any effect on honeybees at that time. The, in fact, they aren't toxic to bees anyway, really. Uh, they don't cause any resistance problems. And in fact, they're approved in organic production, almost all of them. So I think you want to remember that uh, not always do you have to say, I'm going to see a problem and then treat it. And for these particular pests, this is just a good approach. And then you see in the, the slightly uh, faded text at the bottom that some commercial growers may choose or have to do some other things later on to get the level of control necessary in commercial orchards. Rick, can you clarify? There's a question about Darwin oil having any negative effect on honeybees. Can you clarify that? No, it does not. Okay, You should not be using a dormant oil uh, during the time blossoms are open. There is no residual effect on anything that isn't coated by the oil spray itself. And, and the question that says, question does there. the temperature have to be at a certain level? You should not spray these when temperatures are going to drop below freezing uh, in the next, I believe, the labels typically say 48 hours. So you don't want to spray if it's about to freeze. Um, Let's look at the idea of monitoring. And we're going to pick on that insect that's the key one in apples everywhere, the codling moth. Uh, you can order these traps as small kits from uh, Great Lakes IPM. They'll sell you three traps and enough lures to get through the season and enough of those little sticky liners in the bottom to uh, be able to change them occasionally as you need to. And we'd tell somebody with a small orchard they'd use at least three traps to monitor populations. If you're living in town and you've got a backyard, two or three trees, and your neighbor down the road has two or three, and somebody on the other side of the block has two or three, each of you buy a trap and tell each other what you catch. Uh, typically, we don't have any orchards in Illinois that would need more than 10 or 12 traps. Uh, we just don't have those big orchards here. You're going to uh, hang the, the traps as soon as blossoms are over, and you're going to check them twice a week to see how many codling moths you catch. Now, this whole idea that you could put out a pheromone, a chemical that's produced by one insect to 
communicate in some way with other insects in the same species, that we could use that to trap and monitor populations can be taken a step greater in commercial orchards or in orchards, just not in isolated trees. And that's to put out the pheromone to disrupt mating. You put out enough of it that insects don't find each other. Males don't find females. The problem that uh, arises for you folks in, in town with just a few trees is that this has a real big edge effect. It doesn't kill anything. It just keeps males from finding females. So if they mate in the neighbor's uh, apple tree and then the female flies across the fence to yours, you've got nothing there that kills it. It's just something that deters mating. But I think it's something if you're a fruit grower you ought to know about because it is an important component in commercial fruit production. What happens is the picture on the lower right in, in A, a female releases a pheromone and a female, a male flies up wing to f upwind, excuse me, to find her. If you put a bunch of fake pheromones in an orchard, the male can't accomplish that. Um, the uh, Rick, result, one quick question there. Yes. One quick question there about, you know, uh, from an L, can you catch that one while we're here? Um, no. Will this work like June bug traps? If you're the one hanging the trap, you attract more insects to your yard. No problem there, by the way, because the only thing you attract to the trap is males, and males can't do anything useful to hurt you. Okay? They can mate with a female, but they were going to find a female anyway. When you put out a trap for codling moths, you don't do anything to bring in insects, and then they cause problems in the same way you do with Japanese beetle. We'll talk about why a little bit later. Um, these things do work in commercial orchards, and the reason is you sort of permeate a good sized portion of air, maybe a quarter acre, a half acre, or several acres, and in those cases, mating disruption works. If you got a single backyard tree, it won't. But anyway, that's how it works, and this is what these things look like. They're just plastic. Uh, dispensers with pheromone in them and you hang them by in large numbers. In commercial orchards it's uh, somewhere between 200 and 400 per acre. It's actually pretty practical though. The other insect that many people spray for without trying to sample first is plum curculio. And you can make a decision on this based on what you've seen in your backyard trees or in your orchard in the past. Um, it's a most common pest where orchards or trees are in proximity to woods or other trees around you. Um, so at Petal Fall, you're going to be spraying for this. You're going to monitor and scout for other things. And the Tree Fruit Pest Management Handbook gives you an idea what you'd be looking for. This is Plum Curculio. If you look at the picture on the lower right, you can see the, the signs of its presence. Uh, the little weevil in the upper picture comes out of the woods or another place around you and uh, chews holes in the, the apple, turns around and lays an egg in it, and the larva starts to develop in the apple. Lots of times it doesn't survive, and at harvest all you have is the scars that are on the apple in the lower right. If you have a lot of this, uh, you can still eat those apples, but you sure can't sell them. Okay? Or at least most people can't sell them. So the spray that people would use would be Imidan. If we're talking small-scale growers, Avant for orchardists. Uh, these are different kinds of insecticides. Organic growers might use something called Surround plus Pyganic, which is a pyrethrin. Um, and if you are a backyard grower and you're willing to use the typical multi-purpose fruit tree spray, yes, it has something in it that will help cut the numbers of these as well. Uh, this insect is a problem in eastern North America, not in Washington. And so uh, the people, the commercial growers who like to follow the Washington and California spray recommendations uh, may miss it because they don't have to deal with it. We, we do. What's the range of these insects? Um, the moths that occur uh, will fly a few hundred yards. They will drift downwind a little bit further. If you were to plant an orchard in the middle of a square mile of a cornfield, uh, it would take a few years before you'd probably find many of them ever get to you, but eventually they'd find you. Um, in urban settings and in areas where orchards are common, they move among orchards a little bit. 
Uh, a lot of your insect issues are confined to your orchard, but not entirely. They do move around. So a few hundred yards to a few miles is not uncommon. And we're going to get to one in a minute that travels much, much, much further. Let's talk about coddling moth because it's an example of something. This is an accidentally introduced pest in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Uh, the mature larvae, the caterpillars, uh, overwinter in little silken cocoons. Uh, by overwinter, I mean they survive through the winter outdoors in that way. They pupate inside a cocoon in the spring, and the moths emerge typically during bloom in the period when petals are dropping from flowers. And the date for that differs remarkably from southern Illinois to northern Illinois, but the stage of tree development is a pretty good predictor. The females lay eggs on the twigs and leaves, the larvae hatch, they immediately chew a hole in the fruit, and they tunnel to the center of the apple to feed on the seeds. And they will complete development, crawl out, turn into pupae, produce moths, and depending on where we are in the state and how hot it is each year, they will undergo two or three generations or pass through two or three generations per year. I'll get to the uh, Imidan question in just a sec, okay? Um, and again, the reason that people used, quote, cover sprays for a long, long time, and we still do, is that once that insect chews into the fruit, there's nothing you do to get it out. So you have to kill it or somehow prevent it from entering. Mating disruption is another approach. Because once you see the hole in the apple, unless you're going to dig through each apple and pull it out, you're not going to get it. Okay? Uh, once it's inside, it's safe. The old approach was to use some of the organophosphate insecticides. And Guthion and Imidan were really widely used commercially. Imidan was always available to backyard growers, but it is an organophosphate. And if you go back about 15, 18 years to when we passed a Food Quality Protection Act federally, the organophosphate insecticides became less and less available for use to anybody, and especially to homeowners. Uh, I believe you still can buy some Imidan by way of uh, one of the catalog suppliers. Um, who's the company in Indiana? Can anybody help me with the name of that one? Um, Anyway, I believe you can still buy from some catalog suppliers, but it is harder to get now. The newer things that commercial growers use, you ought to be happy with, are much, much less toxic. Uh, they are legitimately called reduced risk insecticides. Doesn't mean they are perfectly safe, but they are indeed much less risky. If you are a homeowner and you can afford the rather high price tag for it, and trust is something you can use uh, that you can buy. You can buy Spinosad, um, and those are not only available to homeowners, they're also um, certified for use in organic production. You can look in the Home Pest Control Guide for a list of the products for you. Why is it people use traps? Because you never really know these insects are present until you find the hole in the side of the fruit and the larva has already gone in. So if you use a trap, you catch moths, you catch a couple of moths today, you catch a couple of moths three days later, you say, yep, flight has started. And if you're a commercial grower, you say, I can start a degree day model. And 220 to 240 degree days later, based on a 50 degree threshold, the eggs are going to hatch and the larvae are going to enter the fruit. And so you would spray before that happened. You can also just say, typically, it's 12 to 14 days after uh, you catch moths, there, going to be, there are going to be eggs hatching and larvae entering fruit. And so you would say, if it's pretty cool, it's going to be a few days more. If it's pretty hot, it's going to be a few days less. But you would have the basic idea that way. Um, hey, Rick, can you yes. give a 60-second uh, lesson on degree days for us? Insects develop faster, the hotter it is. They have a developmental threshold, which is often somewhere around 50 degrees Fahrenheit, but it differs among species. The a degree day is sort of the average temperature for the day minus the threshold. And there are a few nuances to that. But if you said the, av the low today was 60 and the high is 80, the average is 70. 70 minus the threshold of 50, we got 20 degree days that day. And it just is a way of gauging how fast insects or plants will develop. Um, 
most people would say you're going to spray every couple of weeks if there are still eggs hatching. And that's how the commercial approach works with some nuance. Let's do a quick version of some other insects instead of going so fast. Another one in Illinois north of I-70 but not to the south is apple maggot. This is a fly. The larvae are maggots. They tunnel into fruit. And the way you monitor these is with red spheres coated with stickum. Uh, and you can buy these from Great Lakes IPM. And in fact, this is a case where you can, if you're willing, trap out insects, meaning you can put enough traps in a tree to uh, catch enough flies before they lay eggs that you greatly reduce damage. In a backyard tree, a typical dwarf or semi-dwarf tree, you'd put three or four traps in a single tree. You can see why that can work if you've got three trees in your backyard and why it doesn't work if you've got 300 trees per acre and 20 acres of trees. You just can't do it. It is easily controlled with cover sprays, and you can find them in either the spray guides or the backyard pest control guide. San Jose scale, if you ever happen to see apples at harvest that have these, uh, Kankakee County, are the apple maggots attracted to ripe fruit? They're attracted to fruit from the time they emerge until they quit, which in this part of the world is uh, typically mid to late June to early July is the first emergence, and they start laying eggs on apples as soon as they emerge. And again, the traps can tell you when that's happening. San Jose scale, if you see the uh, red rings with a white center on apples, that's San Jose scale. They are more important when they become so common on twigs, as in the lower left picture, that they actually effectively girdle the, the cambium there. It's so many feeding on the twig. And this is the one that you try to control with oil before bloom. So if you saw the symptom on apples in the fall, that's when you use the dormant oil in the spring. And that'll help you out a lot. Um, this is one, again, and we're going to be real fast on this. The commercial growers can hang traps. You can count degree days. You can make decisions. You can monitor with just black electrical tape wrapped sticky side out around twigs. If you had problems in a tree last year, you know, want to know when to look for these crawlers. If you might have to spray later, uh, you can monitor in this way. So there are some greater details if we get a little more sophisticated. And then different insecticides. And I put these here only to point out there is something good to the fact that there are so many insecticides because many of them are much more specific. They don't kill everything. You still have to use them at the right time and be careful about bees. But uh, they don't kill all the natural enemies that some of the previous ones did, like Guthion and Imidan. If you're an organic grower, there are several things you might try. I won't read this whole list for you. But for example, on the very bottom is bagging individual fruits. And if you look, you just Googled bagging apples for insect control, you'll pick up a nice little publication from the University of Kentucky that gives you instructions on it. Basically, you're doing the same thing as putting window screens on your house. You're keeping the insect from getting to where it wants to be. And these are just paper bags. Some people sell some that look almost like women's footy nylons. Uh, they tend to deteriorate and not work so well. So it's a neat idea, but they haven't worked so great. In peaches, the insect of interest that's just like codling moth, but it shows up in peaches, is oriental fruit moth. It's another accidentally introduced one. It's interesting if you go around the part of Illinois where we have um, uh, peaches that oriental fruit moths can be controlled with some insecticides in one area but not in another because of development or resistance. I had a graduate student a couple of years ago who developed a resistance monitoring test that should have uh, a dose of insecticide that should kill about 99% uh, of the insects we'd treat. And we had populations from Calhoun County where 81% survived instead of 1%. And that was a result of using the same insecticide for too many years, too many times. And what they've done now to answer that is they use mating disruption to control oriental fruit moth, or they use some of the newer reduced risk pesticides. We switch to another kind of insect in tree fruits and small fruits. It's stink bugs and plant bugs. These are creatures that instead of having chewing mouth parts, they have a needle-like stylet that they stick into fruit. And where they do, they kill the cells around it. So peaches grow funny around the feeding scar, and it's called cat facing. And don't ask me why. I just tell you what the name is. Um, in apples, you see these dimples. 
and in strawberries you see seedy berries. In the peach one it's probably stink bug, in the apples and strawberries it's probably one of the plant bugs. What do these things look like? You got a couple of stink bugs in the uh, on the right hand two pictures, and a tarnished plant bug in the left. And there are a whole bunch of different stink bugs in the Midwest. Um, pyrethroids are usually used to control them in commercial peaches. Uh, often they are not controlled in apples, and we get by. Uh, if you're a backyard grower, you can buy product. There's a product called Eight out there. It's just a play on the old seven, and it has the same active ingredient that's in the commercial stuff called pounce, and you can use it in gardens and on fruit trees. And there is a new one called brown marmorated stink bug. It was introduced about 14 years ago in the East Coast, accidental uh, hitchhiker in big container, uh, the big containers that look like semi-trailer trucks that are used to load goods into and load on the ships. It probably aggregated in those in the same way that it aggregates in houses like lady beetles do. Uh, we probably shipped a container of that from China or East Asia to here, and they got out when they got here, and they've been spreading west ever since. We do now have detections of this insect in Illinois, and when it shows up in apples and peaches, it causes the same damage that other stink bugs have. It's just that it seems to build up in greater numbers and do more feeding. It's pretty tough to control. And the commercial growers have gotten a lot of information about this and prep for the next couple of years. Um, do remember there are some things that help distinguish it. Uh, in terms of just identification. It has these white bands on the antennae uh, and on the legs. The underside is pretty pale compared to other stink bugs. But do remember there are a lot of things that look sort of like stink bugs and sort of like brown marmorated. So if you think you find this insect, send it to me. I jokingly tell the commercial growers, uh, if you didn't waste your life becoming an entomologist, don't start now. Send those things to somebody who already did that mistake, and we can identify them for you. So uh, that would be the approach. There are peach tree borers and lesser peach tree borers in peaches that uh, tunnel in the bark of either the base of the tree, if it's greater peach tree borer, or up in the scaffold branches. And these insects in commercial orchards are ones where you can use mating disruption. Or here you could put out traps for them that you can buy from Great Lakes IPM. Put them out by late April. Uh, when you begin to catch moths, you apply a trunk spray. The first one is just that. It's a drenching spray to the trunk of something that's not systemic, doesn't move up into the fruit, and you're killing the insects as they go into the bark. If any of you have had ornamental cherry or plum or well, flowering plum, ornamental cherry, and you keep seeing trees die, it's often because of uh, peach tree borer and lesser peach tree borer, especially the second one we'll get to in just a minute. Homeowners can use the pyrethroid spray that you can buy that comes by the name of eight, and commercial growers use some different ones. Um, uh, again, the, the greater peach tree borer is the one that uh, tunnels in at the base of the tree and often kills trees. They just girdle a small tree by feeding around the bark. And sometimes you might make a couple of applications a year. And again, I really encourage you to look at the Midwest Pest Management uh, Handbook because it gives you a lot of background on these things that we don't have time to cover. You can also hang these twist ties. On this case, it's a different color, but it's the same thing. We took this picture and then realized right above it is another creature. This is called terrapin scale in peaches. We won't cover it, but uh, that's okay. Question, are there beneficial insects that attack stink bug and that can be encouraged in some way in an orchard or fruit planting? There are some, not many. Um, the best thing we usually say about encouraging natural enemies is to make sure there are some plants um, with pollen and nectar around because most of the parasites and a number of the predators feed on nectar and pollen as well as the insect thereafter. Biggest problem with stink bugs is those things also attract stink bugs. And uh, stink bug is a tough one to do much with for biocontrol. Uh, spotted wing drosophila in small fruits, we move to that. This insect 
showed up in 2008 in California, 2009 further to the northwest, 2010 in the mid-Atlantic and into Michigan. It's an insect that develops in fruit as it is ripening. Now, Drosophila is a fruit fly, and you, we've got lots of fruit flies. You see them every late summer and fall on your kitchen counter when you bring in tomatoes and they're a little overripe and they start to break down and you see these little gnats flying around, those are Drosophila. They are fruit flies. Uh, this one is a different species and it has been moved around with ripe fruit, infested fruit that's been picked, packed, and sent somewhere, and then they've emerged and so it's moved through the country. In Last summer, we did some trapping for this insect, and pretty much wherever we had traps, we caught it. It is distributed throughout the state. Maybe some townships or counties where it's still pretty rare, but that won't last long. Um, why is it such an issue? Again, it attacks fruit before it's overripe, which was what all the old fruit flies, the, the ones we've had for a long time, have done. The crops that are really vulnerable are strawberries, raspberries, you see the list on the left, blueberries and blackberries, peaches at moderate risk, apples is pretty high on the moderate, well, pretty low on the moderate risk side, meaning not very susceptible, tomatoes, but a lot of weeds and wild plants that produce berries. Um, they like thin-skinned fruit as it is beginning to color. Remember, they're tiny. These are fruit flies, just like the ones you see on the countertops. You see their size on uh, raspberry and strawberry, and you see the spotted wing on the male that gives rise to the name. You can detect these things, and I would actually encourage you guys to do this. I've got a, a website for Michigan for a good site on spotted wing Drosophila on here. Um, and you use either vinegar or yeast in a deli cup. You know, you go to the grocery store, go to the deli, and you buy yourself a two-pound container of potato salad and save the container. Um, somebody has a hand raised. I'm not sure this is the question. What are some good alternatives around beneficial insects that protect a variety of crops, meaning the kind of beneficial insects or the kinds of plants? The kinds of plants are... Uh, legumes and carrot family plants, umbilifers. Uh, I'm not sure where the, James, if they're in Kankakee County and you have a copy of the Beneficial Insects book, uh, the Guide to Biocontrol, there's a nice list in that. Um, I can try to see if I can't supplement the PowerPoint with that. Um, Again, you can make these traps. It's a bait in the bottom, holes in the side. You hang them in the shade where fruit is starting to ripen. And if you catch these things and you've got raspberries there, be aware. They are, a, they are very, very vulnerable to this fly. They cause the fruit to just basically melt down. Can you screen to protect strawberries? Yes, you can. Now, if we go back for a second to this list of susceptible crops, Realize that these things will winter successfully here, but their numbers will be pretty low in the spring. So they'll build with each successive generation every 10 to 12 days all summer long. So the earliest plants, although strawberries are quite vulnerable, populations are likely to be real low. So strawberries may escape. <coughs> when we get later into the summer with blueberries and blackberries, Populations will be building up a little bit, and they'll be more likely to be uh, present and cause problems. When we get to late season raspberries and all the late summer tomatoes, populations are going to be at their highest for any given year, and that's why those crops are particularly vulnerable. There are, when you use the traps, uh, the flies come in because of the bait in the bottom, the, the vinegar or the yeast but they get caught on the yellow card, and you can see all of those with circles around them have little spots. The others may be the same species and be females because the females don't have spots, as you see in this picture. What the females have is an egg-laying device that has little sawtooth-like edges on it. And none of the other Drosophila have this. So they lay eggs into fruit that's already somehow compromised. It's cracked, it's been, it's got an injury of some kind, or it, it's overripe. 
This one goes to fruit as it's coloring because it abrades the fruit with the egg laying device and lays an egg inside. Uh, what are you going to do? Make yourself some traps. Uh, one of the initial slides here had the website for Michigan State University spotted wing drosophila, or you simp simply Google spotted wing drosophila trap and you can get directions for making them. Um, you can use insecticides at five to seven day, in seven day intervals, but you have to uh, be aware that you can use them only so close to harvest. Removing overripe and infested fruit does you know, slow down the population buildup. If you're an organic grower, you can use in trust. If you are a commercial grower, the list is long. If you're a backyard grower, you can still buy malathion. You can buy formulations of uh, pounce, which can be, or of permethrin, the eight product, some of which can be used on small fruits. Uh, and again, take a look at the the home pest control guide, or send me a note because you've got the address, my email address in the first slide. I'm going to really quickly finish two or three more insects uh, just because they illustrate things. This is eastern flower thrips on strawberries. Uh, it feeds on berries when they are very, very tiny and the berries never develop size, color, and flavor correctly. So there's a dime in that picture and those berries are never going to get bigger or more colorful. It's a tiny little insect. You see it at the blue arrow in the lower left uh, feeding in a strawberry blossom. Uh, so it's really tiny. So it looks a little easier to identify in the upper left than it is in the lower left. Um, this one doesn't winter here. Somebody said, "How? what's the range of these insects? Realize that some insects that don't really even fly that well still move long distances. They rise up in the, the, the thermal patterns in the air. They get several hundred feet above the ground, or a few thousand even, and they are moved along with weather systems. So they're moving with that warm air coming from the south. When that front hits a uh, cold air boundary and creates storms and air drops, so do the insects. That's how it gets here. And when it gets here every year determines whether it's going to be a big deal in strawberries. If it makes it before strawberry harvest, it can be a problem. If it immigrate or migrates into the region later, then it's not a problem because strawberries have already escaped. Uh, hot, dry summers favor more and more of them as the season goes on. And this just illustrates that idea of movement. And a number of different insects move in the air hundreds of miles. Uh, it's a little hard to imagine, but it does happen. Um, typically, you can scout for these. You go out as soon as the very first blossoms open. You shake some of them into a bag. And if there are more than two or some people would say as many as 10 thrips in a blossom, you probably ought to spray something to keep them from damaging the fruit. Now, we're talking about spraying it bloom. So you do this when the very first blossoms of a variety open. And if they are there, you spray before much of the bloom is open. Um, and again, this just sort of summarizes that idea. How do you sample? You would shake blossoms into a white cup or a white bowl and look for something that's a little tan something or other about the size of an anther on a flower, and it's wiggling around. And some people say, well, I don't want to have to look for something that's moving around so that you can put a little nail polish remover in the bag and kill them. But then they don't move around, and it's hard to tell them from a little tan piece of flower anther or something. So I'd say don't do that. It's easier just to shake them around in a bag and look for them. If you're a backyard grower, there are Spintor and Entrust products out there you can use. Commercial growers use some other ones. And remember, you always have to obey the little statement that says don't use within so many days of harvest. If you grow strawberries, you've probably at some point had uh, slugs in strawberries. Um, there are lots of ways you can monitor to see if they're there. You lay a board between the rows. You lay a burlap bag uh, between the rows. It's nice and moist. You pick it up in the morning and see if there are slugs on the underside. If there are, you can use some baits to kill them. But remember, the baits are not as attractive as a super ripe red strawberry. And so you want to monitor before you've got ripe fruit and bait before you've got a lot of ripe fruit. Because if you wait, 
then the bait has to compete with a lot of ripe strawberries and the slugs find a lot of strawberries instead of bait. Um, do remember that there are things you do in strawberry production that influence next year's problems. Uh, the slugs that are going to damage fruit this spring hatched from eggs last fall. And the things that would have made for heavy populations would have been a nice wet summer and fall, which we had a little bit of moisture in the fall, but not much in the summer. Uh, and they include things that hold moisture. So if you mulch strawberries with straw and you put it on very early or you take it off very late, you've provided better conditions for slugs. If you don't renovate strawberry beds in the summer by removing a lot of the plant debris and tissue, you create better conditions for slugs. So there are real significant cultural practices you can use to reduce slugs in strawberries. And then I have to do everybody's favorite insect, Japanese beetles. Uh, this thing feeds on hundreds of different plant species, and the larvae feed on the roots of grasses and a few other things. It's another introduced pest. It's been spreading across the country since 1916, and often it's at its absolute worst uh, three or four years after it first shows up. The larvae winter in the soil. They are white grubs. They feed on grass roots. <coughs> they complete their development in the spring, come up, pupate, turn into adults, feed on everything you didn't want them to eat, lay eggs again, and go back into the soil. They are very, very mobile. What you do about killing grubs in your field or your backyard has nothing to do with the number of adults that you're going to see in your backyard. And they feed on lots and lots of things. And all I can say is don't use traps. <laughs> um, the lures and traps for Japanese beetles are a combination of an aggregation pheromone that calls males and females, a sex attractant, and a food odor. So they do bring insects in, and not all of them find the trap. And honestly, there are just too darn many of them to trap out. If you're trying to trap them out of your yard, uh, I'd start with putting four or five traps in all your neighbor's yards, and then four or five in yours, and maybe you get some good out of it. But if you put a couple of traps in your yard, it's not likely to do much good. Same thing for small commercial plantings. Lots of different insecticides, but uh, simply put, all of them are going to kill what's there when you spray if you use one that works against Japanese beetles. Uh, by a couple of days later, most of the beetles that come in and feed on that foliage are going to continue to feed. I would say please do not use the products that are the admire imidacloprid products that you can put beneath trees and shrubs. They're supposed to come up into the foliage and provide year-long control. Well, those also move into the blossoms of at least some plants. They show up in pollen and nectar, and that means they can kill bees. I think it's a real bad idea, and I'm not sure why we ever registered all of those, why they were all approved. But I would really discourage them, or if, you're, if you are a fruit grower, you need pollinators, and you don't uh, protect pollinators when you use those. Um, what about milky spore? Milky spore is a modestly effective product to control grubs. So if you're looking for grub control in your yard, it will help. It won't do a darn thing to reduce the number of beetles in your, on your roses and on your fruit unless everybody in the neighborhood and probably the township is using the same thing. The beetles are way, way, way too uh, mobile, and they come into your plants whether they grew up in your yard or not, or in your small grape or strawberry planting. doesn't matter where well, strawberries aren't an issue, but other crops. They don't have to grow up there to get to you. Uh, again, if you're going to look for any of the sort of specialty stuff for monitoring, Great Lakes IPM is a place to go. I list all these others, but honestly, you you might as well just stick with the one that's Midwestern and, and contact them. There is a newsletter for commercial fruit and veg growers, but if you're a backyard grower and uh, insects are active on raspberries, the same ones are active on your raspberries, whether you're commercial or not. So that's the Illinois Fruit and Veg News. It's available online. If you click on it, and, uh, 
and look at it. You'll find there's an email address where you can send me a request and we put you on an email list where every time there's a new issue we let you know. There are other great newsletters from other states that range from backyard fruit to commercial. Uh, Purdue, Penn State, Rutgers, and Cornell all have great uh, fruit newsletters for commercial growers. So. What I would do is open it up for you to type your uh, questions in the chat, and we'll see what we can answer. Anybody that has questions for Rick, just go ahead and type them in, and, and we'll start uh, working through those. Is there a good publication regarding beneficial insects and fruits? Um, yeah. I can't give you uh, a direct name right now. There's two or three things I could do. If you would, please, um, Kyle had typed in my email address before. Maybe he'll type it in again while I'm talking to you. If you would send me an email, I will send that out to you. There's some information from ATRA. There's some information from uh, the Midwest publication that we did on biological control of insects. Um, but I'd prefer to be a little more specific, and I can do that if you send me a note. Will superior oil decompose in the environment over time? Yes, it does. Uh, you don't really, there is no activity of that material after it dries on a twig or plant material. Once all it effects is the stuff that's there when you spray it. Yes, it does break down. I can't tell you exactly how long. But the amount of oil you are putting out, and yes, these are either vegetable or petroleum based. Some are petroleum based, some are vegetable based. Um, um, that does persist a bit. It has no biological recognizable activity um, after it's landed on the tree and hit whatever was on the tree when you sprayed it. Um, Okay, how can brown rot be controlled in plums? I'll give you first the disclaimer that I'm the bug guy and not the plant pathologist. Uh, there are fungicides you can use in plums. You make those sprays beginning, uh, I believe, for brown rot. Those start during bloom, and you can use fungicides then. Are there good organic controls for brown rot? Uh, it's real tough. I've heard plant pathologists ask that. I've heard them asked the question, uh, what can I do for organic disease control in peaches and plums and avoid all these fruit rots? And their rather flippant answer is go to Colorado and grow on the dry side of the mountains. But then they more straightforwardly say, we just don't have any good organic fungicides. There are some good homeowner products out there. Um, you can buy in the garden centers. Again, take a look in the uh, Home Fruit Pest Control Guide, and I think you'll find some listings there. How do you encourage bees to come to your trees? Um, if you've got enough trees, meaning an acre or so, you rent hives from a beekeeper. If you're in town, uh, you don't spray insecticides that kill them, and generally speaking, bees will find apple trees or in the case of the other things, we're interested in uh, some of the small fruits. Peaches don't need bees. Doesn't mean they don't help, but peaches don't need them. Um, apples and pears do. And just make sure you don't spray them during bloom. Or use any of those systemic neonicotinoids before bloom. Uh, Judy, so what is recommended to protect from Japanese beetles? Um, in Let's start from commercial tree fruit and work our way down. Commercial tree fruit, it's usually imidan, uh, which is one of the old organophosphates. Growers will use some seven, and they'll use some pyrethroids. So if you translate that to backyard gardeners, it would be seven is effective. There are, again, some pyrethroid products out there. Things like eight, which is permethrin. Um, Again, look in the home fruit spray guide, and you'll find the list of what all these label names are according to ingredient. You can use Pyganic, which is the organic product. It really isn't very effective. You have to use it at the top end of the concentration they recommend, and you've got to be willing to spray it uh, more than once. But those are things that can be used. Um, 
spray guide has the commercial spray guide has products by crop and the backyard uh, the home pest control guide, uh, which I think most of the county offices would have would have listings as well. Are June bearing raspberries more free from bad bugs than fall bearing? Yes, in general, not entirely, but yes, simply because some of these things build up through the course of a season, and by late season we have a lot more of them. Not always true, but generally. We have beehives next to our orchard. Is there any good option to control insects in the orchard other than organic? Yeah, you can you know you can have hives next to the orchard and make some of these conventional sprays and not kill bees. Uh, if we're talking hives that are 30 yard or 30 feet away on the other side of the fence uh, and it's downwind, then no, you can't spray those trees with a lot of stuff because it'll drift on the hives. But if we're talking even you know a few yards away, 30, 40 yards away, and not downwind. The two things you have to be aware of is don't spray any of your stuff while the, the fruit is in bloom, but secondly, make sure you are creating a good ground cover out there that's mostly grass and not a flower, not flowering weeds that attracts bees, because if the row middles are all full of flowering clover or something like that, uh, it doesn't matter that your trees aren't in bloom. If you spray, you're going to be spraying a blooming plant, which is going to be the ground cover. So you want to make sure that's not the case. But otherwise, most of these products can be used as long as they aren't used during bloom. So take a look at the the uh, Midwest Tree Fruit Spray Guide. And again, most of those products are OK if you don't have blooming plants in your orchard and you don't drift onto bees. Uh, can you give more information about the organic insecticides? Will they be harmful to beneficial insects too? Um, yes and no. Yes, they are. Um, for some of you who have used for worm control in crops, the organic approved Bacillus thuringiensis or BT products, Dipel, Thuricide, Javelin, all sorts of them out there in the backyard. It's worm killer this or worm killer that. If they contain Bacillus thuringiensis, they kill caterpillars and nothing else. They won't be toxic to bees. If you move up to something like Entrust, uh, it's less broad spectrum, but it will kill bees and it will kill some beneficials. If you think of uh, Pyganic as the organic pyrethrin products, um, those will pretty much kill anything and everything, but they are very, 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 very short-lived, which means you can spray them to control the pests that are on a plant, and the ones that you don't kill, when the predaceous beetle or the parasitic wasp comes in the next day, there isn't a residue there that's going to kill it. Most of the organic botanical products are much, much more short-lived than conventional products, which means they don't kill things for as long, and that's good and bad. Uh, they don't kill beneficials for as long. Um, the spray oils that you can use in organic production are uh, not necessarily safer to beneficials, but they kill only the stuff that the spray oil lands on when you spray. Uh, so the beneficials that are sort of flying in and out and to and away from uh, plants will not all be there at the time you spray. So you avoid killing them just by the fact that the stuff doesn't have any residual toxicity. Um, don't know if that answered your question, but that's the basic idea. Do herbicides that control dandelions harm bees and other beneficial insects? Um, most not very much. Some do, um, and I can't give you that list. I don't know it by heart. If you were to Google uh, uh, pesticide toxicity to bees, you'll get a, a list of a lot of things. But somewhere on the top of that list, you'll get a fact sheet from Purdue University. And they use data from several states around them. They just happen to be the ones who did it. And you'll get a list of toxicity of different 
insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides uh, to honeybees. I'm not sure if it's general to catch all other bees, but you'll get a list of those. I think you can find that pretty readily with just that, that Google search, pesticide toxicity to bees. And the Purdue one is as good as any one I've seen on there. Okay, it looks like we're good, Rick. So I um, want to thank Alrighty. you for taking time to work with us today. And so with that, we'll let everybody go. And thanks for your time, everyone.